chapter 5 tonight. Matthew chapter 5. We spent a pretty good chunk of time last week dealing with a portion of Scripture from the Sermon on the Mount that we call the Beatitudes. Just by way of reminder for those that weren't here, remember the Beat when we look at the Beatitudes, this is this is not a set of things that Jesus is saying, if you do this, this. Here's the outcome. If you do this, here's the outcome. If you do this, here's the outcome. That's not what Jesus says. He says, Ye blessed are they. Blessed are. Meaning, you've already been blessed. You already have received happiness and joy. Delight. Remember that we are human beings, not human doings. So Jesus, does, he teaches us about serving him. But he teaches us about serving him because of who we are in him. It's not about what we do, but it's about who we are. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. As born-again believers, we are disciples. We don't do things to become disciples. We are instant, upon our salvation, we are instantaneously made disciples. We are disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Everything about us is about following Christ who he is, what he teaches, and we need to better understand that. I would ask to actually that you pray for me. I'm praying about doing a study. It would be a very in-depth, a very um, long uh, study, uh, but I am praying about doing a study uh, looking at the life of Christ step by step by step by step. And... Um, Yes, it is found, it's, I had to learn it in school, uh, all pastoral students, actually all students at Veritas have to take the class, um, but it is arguably one of the most helpful classes I ever took, and just tearing apart Jesus' earthly ministry. So I would ask that you pray for me um, about that specifically. But as followers of Jesus, it's imperative that we understand that we are already followers. It's not about becoming followers. Okay, uh, And the reason that we talk about that is because the Beatitudes are often mistaught. They're often misinterpreted. They're often misunderstood. Last week after our service, I was talking with a handful of you afterwards, and, and uh, uh, one of you even commented. You were looking up notes and stuff, and, and I can tell. I can tell when you're, just remember, I'm elevated, so I can see when your phone comes out. I can see when you're flipping pages. I can see all of it, right? And uh, a few of you, and that's fine, uh, a few, I would, as long as you can pay attention, I don't care, um, but a few of you were actually looking, there were some things that God was speaking to our hearts about last week that was new. I could tell. And we just kept going. But one of you came, up, came to me after the service last week, and you actually made mention of, um, so had actually brought that up, and how, hey, Pastor, it was right in line with what? Well, the stuff I was looking up is right in line. Yeah, look at it. It's going to. I'm not going to give you garbage. With the Lord's help. <laughs> in and of myself, I'm liable to fill you with a whole lot of garbage. But uh, with the Lord's help, I'm not going to do that, right? And so it's important that we understand the Beatitudes before we move any further. Because Jesus is not talking, he's not telling his disciples about what they need to do. He's revealing to them who they actually are as disciples as followers the beatitudes have to be understood now remember we can summarize the beatitudes this way that the beatitudes are attributes of christ that we all have within us and when jesus is is giving what we call the beatitudes he's referring to that pouring out of those attributes the, the pouring out that should come from us the pouring out into the world which ties directly into the next part of his teaching, okay? Um, so it's important that we get that. And I think you would agree that the Beatitudes, uh, it was a challenging study. Um, for me, anyways, it was challenging in preparation and making sure that my thoughts were, were flowing and that everything made sense and that I wasn't inadvertently making it about the do, but about what Christ has already done and about who we are and not who we should be. 
So it makes it challenging, but, but I do believe that it was insightful and a helpful study last week. But as our Lord concludes his thoughts on the Beatitudes, he's going to shift his focus to one important attribute and responsibility that we have, not only as believers, as disciples, but as a church. So I'm going to invite you to stand, if you would, in honor of God's word. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. We left off in verse 12, so we're going to begin in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is still speaking, and he says this, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Have you ever noticed Jesus asked this question, or, or makes this statement, but if the salt have lost his savor, not its. Don't add words when you study God's word. Read his words. But if the salt have lost his savor, we know from that Jesus is speaking to disciples specifically, individual people. And we'll, we'll build on that, okay? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this time as we study this next portion uh, of his Sermon on the Mount. Father, we thank you for the day that we have to come to worship, uh, sing praises to you, to fellowship. Father, we truly are blessed to be able to call ourselves your children and to call ourselves brother and sister. Father, we ask this evening that you would bless our time in your word. Lord, I ask for wisdom and discernment, clarity of thought. Lord, we need to, uh, I need your help this evening. We need you this evening. Father, help us to understand. Lord, you have given us such a great wealth of information in uh, these few short words. Father, I ask that you would uh, be in control this evening so that we would glean all that we can from these words. And Lord, that you, you would be honored and glorified in all we do and say. Father, we ask you to bless this time tonight. We ask you to be with those who are unable to be with us this evening. We ask that you would continue to watch over them and to heal them and bring them back safely to us. Father, we love you. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I think it's interesting to point out here, for time's sake, uh, I felt led by the Lord to split salt and light. It's in one paragraph. But to unpack that in one night, y'all run me out of here. I'm already going to be pushing it to get done, okay? Um, and that's fine. That's fine. We're not in a hurry. I know you're not in a hurry, but I, 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 I do think about it, whether or not you realize it. I do think about the time, and, and I just felt like it would be too much and believe God. I don't believe we could glean all that God would have us by throwing it all together. So we're going to split it tonight. So tonight we're going to look at this. The title tonight is simply The Salt of the Earth. I know, nothing fancy, right? We're the salt of the earth. Uh, Jesus said so. I think it's interesting to make a note, though, that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said he's, he called himself the light. He is the light that came to, in darkness. He never said he was the salt. So think about that. Now, Jesus is the light, and as the light, and we'll unpack this more next week, but... But we understand from a, a basic foundational level, at, at, at minimum, we understand that because we have the light of Christ within us, then our light should shine, not hide it under a bushel. It's, it's letting the light of Christ out, right? So we see this flowing out again. Jesus never calls himself the salt. Remember, two years ago during our shutdown, we looked at the I am's of Jesus. Remember that? 
um, we looked at it a couple years ago, and uh, I remember because it was just Kaylee and I in here staring at a computer and a, later on a video camera. One of those I am statements that Jesus made was never I am the salt. Remember that. Because tonight we've come to a passage where Jesus is addressing a need for all believers, all Christians, all his disciples to serve as the salt of the earth. And in this passage, the light of the world. We're gonna, we will discover as we move through these verses that both salt and light are necessary and much needed today. The world's a very dark place, but the world is also a very bland and unsavory place. Each of these elements has a distinct and profound effect on this, their surroundings. So I want to take a few moments this evening, and with the Lord's help, we will consider some of the attributes of salt. As we think about the title, The Salt of the Earth, Re while remembering, Jesus never said, I am the salt. He did say, I'm the light. Okay? So just remember that. So let's look at our text first. Verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing. It is therefore moving forward, thenceforth, good for nothing, but to be cast out, to be trodden under foot of men. So I want us to notice first the presence of salt. I mean, that's what Jesus said, right? Ye are, ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are. It's a definitive statement. You are currently. You are now. Not you will be. Not you eventually. Not you were. Not you have been. No, 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 no. Jesus says, ye are. So we see again, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Ye. It's very personal. Okay? But the presence, when we think about the presence of the salt, it's important that we understand it's right now. Ye are. This isn't something future. As followers of Christ, we are. And Jesus is revealing that the believer is the salt of the earth. Remember, Jesus is sitting uh, up the side of a, a mount, uh, not a mountain the way we think of mountain. Uh, well, I should say the way that I think of mountain. I grew up west of the Mississippi, and so when I think of mountains, I think of the Rockies. <laughs> okay? Uh, when uh, New Yorkers think of mountains, they think of the Adirondacks. We call those hills out west. Okay? We're going to go up in the hills. All right? Um, when we think of, when I think of mountains, I think of Washington and uh, Mount Rainier, the volcano uh, that can be seen, uh, you know, because its summit is like 20,000 feet. But Jesus is, so when we think of mountain, I, I would rather you think of like the Adirondacks, okay? Um, may, he may have been a little bit higher, but I, I don't want you to think of some big stormy Himalayan or rocky mountain range. Uh, and he's not up on top of it. We say the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus was on it, but that doesn't mean he was on the summit. Okay, so we, we get this idea that he's standing up on top. Blessed are they, right? I just don't see it. What we do get in verse 1 and 2 is Jesus, because of the multitudes, he, he kind of needed to, to get free of the craziness. And uh, free himself from all of that. And so he's gone up into the mountain. Uh, likely just high enough that now his voice can project. And he, but he's not speaking directly to the multitudes. Surely the multitudes are still there. They've gathered. And they, they're within earshot. And his voice can project. But he's actually separated himself for a little bit of one-on-one -on -one with his disciples. So we know that Jesus is speaking to his disciples here. Okay, so let's, I know it's a lot of background work, but we've got to make sure that we've got it, okay? And he says, as a believer, as a, my follower, as my disciple, ye are the salt of the earth. Now, this isn't something that's open for debate. This isn't something open for discussion. Jesus doesn't say, so how do you feel about being the salt of the earth? What do you think? He doesn't do that. He says, ye are. He declares it. He says, no, 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 the presence of salt, it, yeah, you're already present, you're already here. We are the salt of the earth. There's no discussion. 
If you're here today, you're listening to this later, and you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you place your faith and trust in Him to be your personal Lord and Savior, you are the salt of the earth. Whether you realize it or not, you are. And as long as there are Christians, there will be salt. But you know, it's interesting when we think about salt, we need salt in our lives. It, there must be a presence of salt. Salt is necessary to good health, actually. We have salt in our blood that runs through our body. Our cells need salt to function properly. Now, they don't need a whole lot of it, so if you're one of those that likes sitting out at the table and get everything all fired up, that's not necessarily healthy, okay? But our bodies do have a natural amount of salt and need that natural amount of salt for uh, uh, water uh, retention and various things to help us stay hydrated. Um, this is an anatomy, uh, anatomy and physiology class, and I'm not necessarily qualified to speak to those degrees anyways. But it is vital to human life. And I understand that we live in a, in a time where salt is discouraged in people's diet. I get that. But I assure you of this. In front of all of you as my witnesses, honey, don't take salt out of my diet. We're, but many people are told to cut it out completely, right? Because they have too much. And too much of anything, is excess of anything is not good for you, physically or spiritually, by the way. Uh, things that could potentially do you harm, that is, are not good for you physically or spiritually. But regardless of scientific opinions and medical research and all of those things, as I said, a certain amount of salt is necessary for our health. It, we have to have salt present. But let's look at this from a spiritual point of view, because that's what Jesus does, right? If God allows us to do this study on, the par on Jesus' life, and we'll begin to tear down and really learn some of these parables, remember parables are something that he, he taught specifically for his dis disciples, really. They were earthly stories with a spiritual meaning and significance, okay? And they really were primarily for his disciples. Now, he would share them openly, but, but if you really look at him, he was generally speaking to one, of the, one, if not multiple, of the disciples when he used a parable. So it makes sense that Jesus here in verse 13 says, you are the salt of the earth. He's using a parable type of illustration, right? Can we say it that way? It's not a parable, but... A parable type of illustration, can we say that and, and be okay? But he's, that's what he's telling the disciples. So he's, we, we need to look at the spiritual aspect and spiritual view. Because just as salt is vital to the human life, salt is vital to our spiritual lives as well. Just as salt is discouraged in the lives of many people for medical and health reasons, I believe that we live in a day where Salt is discouraged in the church. I believe that some have removed it completely from their lives. They are unconcerned about their influence. This is believers now because believers are the salt. So when I say removed it, it, underline that, italicize it, would be salt. And I believe many churches have removed salt from their bodies, their spiritual body. I believe that there are many Christians who just are unconcerned, churches unconcerned about their influence in the world. But again, being the salt is, is not negotiable. It is a non-negotiable. We are the salt, Jesus says. You're there, you're in place, you are present. Salt is present. Whether you accept the job or not, you are still an influence to others for Christ. God desires our true worship. He desires our complete surrender. He, des he, he desires a desire on our part to make a difference. We are here. As a church, we are here to reach others. We are the salt. Salt is necessary. It is necessary for spiritual health. I want my kids to see salt in my life. 
I want them to know that there's something special about serving God. If we don't ever seem excited about the things of God, how in the world can we expect anyone else to get excited? Why would you want something? Why would they want what we have that we're not excited about? What is so appealing about it? Nothing. So it's imperative that we understand salt. So let's look at the properties of salt. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted, Jesus asks. Salt has certain properties, and this was really kind of the fun part for me, studying and working through all these properties, right? What is, what's a common thing, just one or two of you, what's a common thing you've heard about salt when, when uh, looking at the Sermon on the Mount through your, your experience and, and um, maybe your own study, you've preachers before, whatever, maybe you've listened to a CD or on, on radio or something, you've heard somebody or read something about being salt of the earth. What, what do you commonly hear about salt in reference to this passage? What do you commonly hear about? It preserves. Yeah, that's a common one. What else? Enhances flavor, right? And, and so that's what really got me excited in this portion of the study is looking at the properties of salt. Because I find myself saying, okay, all right, Lord, you said, we are the salt of the earth. As disciples, we are the salt of the earth. Specifically, even the, the church, because we are a, uh, a, an assembly of believers, right? So we as the church are the salt. We as individuals are the salt. So what is it? What is it about the salt? What are all the things about the salt? Now, this is not an all-inclusive list, but it was an exciting portion of the study because salt has specific properties that are always present. And the properties that are always present cause people to react in a specific way. Especially when the salt interacts with other elements. Think about rock salt. That is salt. Right? So we know that salt preserves. Got it. Okay, it's often used to preserve meat from decay. Um, it works as a preservative. Um, think of it this way, from a spiritual perspective. The nation of Israel was God's people. They had lost their home to bondage. There was no salt. They weren't preserved. They weren't preserved. Now, I believe that Christians in America have helped prevent the wrath of God from destroying our nation. I really do believe that. As the salt, we can help preserve our families from the decay of this world. So it's, it's a twofold thing, right? Proverbs 14, 34 says this, Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so we need to preserve our morals. We need to preserve the church. We need to preserve our homes. We need to preserve things in our lives. Because as the salt, we are the ones that interact with other elements. So just as, just as physical or literal salt is a preservative of meat and whatnot, right? That's why you shouldn't put a whole lot of salt on your canned vegetables because they have been bathing in it, okay? But from a spiritual perspective, as the salt, we are the preservative. We we have the preservative. We carry the preservative. We are. What, what, is, it, what is it about us that, that makes us salt? What is it about us as followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ? What is it about us that enables us to preserve families and churches and, and be that preservative? It's the gospel. It's the intimate, rela personal relationship with Christ that is available to everyone. It is, it is the Word of God. It is the time spent with the Lord daily in the Word, getting to know Him. That's what preserves a family. That's what preserves the church. That's what 
pres- preserves you as an individual, spiritually. It is we have all of the properties necessary for preservation. And what, is those, what are those properties necessary for preservation? The Word of God. We have with us and within us the ability through Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we have within us the ability to understand and know God. We don't preserve, however, if we twist what God says to suit our own wants and desires and level of comfort. We need to preserve our morals. The societal morals. We need to preserve our churches and our homes. We are the preservers. We have, we could say it more succinctly this way, we have truth. We carry truth. Salt also penetrates. Salt has the natural ability to penetrate whatever it touches. Think about this time of year we were talking just before the service about how the salt just destroys our carpet why because it penetrates it doesn't just sit on top it is going all the way down to the concrete underneath and we know what salt does to concrete it penetrates that's why concrete that's why sidewalks around here aren't smooth salt eats it it penetrates it it gets into the various layers of the substrate and causes decay. It eats away at what is there. If left long enough, it will continue to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and penetrate deeper and penetrate deeper and penetrate deeper. Right? I mean, that's we understand that, especially this time of year. But what about the spiritual aspect? As followers of Christ, as disciples of Jesus, we too have the ability to penetrate the sin and darkness of this world. Not in and of our own righteousness, but because we carry with us Christ. We have the ability as the salt to penetrate this world of sin and darkness around us. We have the ability as disciples to gain ground here. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're more than conquerors. We have the ability to penetrate. That's what salt does. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. So we have the ability to preserve. We have the ability to penetrate. Now, only because we have Christ. But it's our job. It's our responsibility. Remember, Jesus said, ye are, not how do you feel about. Okay? Salt also purifies. It is often used to purify and cleanse. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 20 to 22 says this, And he said, Bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And they bring it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spoke. Uh, You know, salt water is used to cleanse sores and wounds in our flesh. It burns like the dickens, but it purifies. It has a purifying effect. As disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, we too should have a cleansing effect on the wounds around us. Think about it. People are hurting. As salt, we have the ability to cleanse and purify. Have you ever heard the saying, um, it'll cure what ails you? Salt will cure what ails you. We are the salt. We have what they need for their brokenness and their wounds. We have it. We we have what they need to be healed and purified. Spiritually. Spiritually now. Come on. Stay stay focused. 
As a church, I believe we should have an influence in the community that would cause some people to clean up some areas of their lives. I believe as a church, we should have such an influence that, that people can't help but make some changes in their lives. Because as the salt, we should naturally, by our testimony, we should naturally be purifying and healing wounds. I'll never forget what it was like the first time I was talking with somebody and they asked who I was and I told them I'm the pastor of Heritage Baptist Church and they had been cussing or whatnot and they're like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right? And I, and I respect that. And I'll never forget what that was like the first time. I was just blown away that they would do that. But it happens all the time. Why? Because I'm salt, Jesus said. penetrate now it's not me but it's spirits bearing witness the Holy Spirit is doing something he's working right so there's something different and that's penetrating and it's penetrating to a level where changes begin to happen remember when salt interacts with other elements it changes those other elements other elements don't change salt Salt changes the other elements. The sidewalk does not make the, the, the rock salt melt. It doesn't. The salt eats the concrete. Are you following me? Salt, when it interacts with other elements, affects the other elements. The other elements never affect salt. Well, pastor, what about when you put salt in water? It dissolves still there it's still there can't get rid of it because salt is the dominant force here salt is the the thing that has the power do you think it's a coincidence that Jesus looked at his disciples and said hey as my disciples you're the salt of the earth This is awesome. I'm going to get excited here pretty quick. It's awesome. It purifies. We as a church should have influence in the community that fosters change. Salt promotes thirst. Oh, man. Oh, man. Think about the Samaritan woman. Create, salt creates a thirst for water when it's consumed. Kay, or, uh, it's not Kay, Kaylee was probably working too, but Eden and Christy were both working closing shifts last night. So I took Eden to work and called Christy and said, hey, are you going to get home? And she's like, no, some things came up. I need to stay here until close. I said, okay, do you care if I just grab a burger or something on the way home? And she's like, no, nah, that's fine. I said, I just don't feel like cooking for me, and then you guys having cold dinner anyways. So... At any rate, so I just pulled into McDonald's, right? It sounded good. Just an old nasty cheeseburger from McDonald's, right? It just sounded good. Sometimes they do, right? There's nothing fancy about it. But God loves me because I got brand new French fries. I might have had the first McDonald's French fries out of that oil. I'm getting thirsty just thinking about it. There is nothing better than fresh oil used to make mcdonald's french fries but man so i pull them out of the bag and i put them in the little console deal and i'm driving home and they're burning my fingers and getting salt prints on my hands while i'm driving right you just you, you got to eat them while they're hot you don't yeah cold french fries for the birds so at any rate i noticed last night and probably because i knew what tonight's sermon was and I noticed when I got my drink, you know, they give you a drink first. I put it in the cup holder, and they gave me the bag, and it has the straw and stuff in it. And you throw that on the seat, and I'm eating my fries. I'm getting home. What do you think about ha what do you think happens about halfway between half moon and here? <laughs> right? 
It's like I just took a big old bite out of homemade cornbread because that stuff sucks 90% of the moisture out of your body, right? There was so much salt on those fries. Don't get me wrong, they were divine, okay? They, God might have made those himself, okay? They were that good. But the salt. I couldn't find that straw fast enough. Driving, doing this, right? Looking for and then trying to open. You ever try to open a straw while you're driving? That's just the dumbest thing. Right? I couldn't. I threw that straw in the cup. Right? Are you with me? Half of it's gone. I get home like, where's all my drink? But that's what it does. It creates this thirst. When you consume salt, you can't get enough fluids. And have you ever noticed this? If you are thirsty and nothing quenches your thirst but water, what made you thirsty was salt. If you are thirsty... Sometimes milk will quench your thirst. Sometimes a nice cold Coca-Cola or Dr. Pepper will quench your thirst. Big old tall glass of iced tea. Right? But when it's McDonald's french fries, that Coca-Cola didn't cut it. I wanted the ice in the Coca-Cola. Are you with me? Are you following me? You want water. You want your body wants to re, wants water. It creates this thirst that you just can't avoid. As the salt of the earth, okay, we too should create a thirst for Christ. People observing us should want what we've got. We tease Brother Mike about his zeal. Not to tease him, but we love him. And it is real, and he's zealous for the Lord. It's when somebody's zealous for you tease him, right? It's all in good fun. It's that he doesn't get offended by it. You know, it's like, hey, you, you, you sick brother Mike on him, right? He'll get him, right? We, he just has that zeal. But we should. There should be something about us that, that people want. Well, Pastor, why do you say that? Because Jesus said it. You're the salt of the earth. There should be something about you as my disciple that makes people want to be my disciple. Look, I'll be really honest with you. This may sound harsh. It may sound cold. But I'm going to be really honest. I know Christians that if they were the only Christian I knew, I probably would have never accepted Christ. Why would I want to? Why do I want to be like that? That's what I have to look for. You're bitter. Just nasty, arrogant. You walk around with your nose up here. You're going to drown in a good rainstorm. You think you're better than everybody. Come on. We know Christians like that. They want to sit and just run their mouths. Uh, that's not being the salt. It's not being the salt. Because salt makes us thirst. And as the salt of the earth, we should make those around us thirst for Jesus. They, they should thirst for what we've got. This excitement and the zeal and this, this, this there's, that, that there's something about, that, about him or her. I, I want what they got. Because salt produces thirst. When Jesus is foremost in our life, when he reigns supreme in our life we can help others desire what we have because when life's falling apart it doesn't wreck us when when things are tough it doesn't get us down it may it may discourage us we may be confused we may have those moments but it doesn't but we give it to the lord and Everything changes. We don't have to carry that. The world doesn't have that. They have to carry it. The world has every horrible situation of life hanging from their hip. They have no 
way of removing that outside of Christ. So when the world sees you and I, there should be something about us that they want. They, want, they should want what we've got. Why? Because we have the peace that passes all understanding. Look, I don't know why I can handle such and such situation, friend, but I'll tell you, without Jesus, I couldn't. There's hope. There's thirst. They want what they can't get. Think about the woman at the well. What did Jesus tell her? The water that I give. If you drink of the water that I give, you'll never thirst again. There's something that people want. We can give that to them. But they have to want it. And they're not going to want it if you've lost your Savior. See, we've got to make the transition to the next part of the verse. We must, in order for people, in order for us to promote thirst and, and, and create within people the desire and thirst for Jesus, we must live right, we must talk right, we must walk right. That doesn't mean walk right. That means conduct ourselves right. That means live our lives in accordance with Scripture. Live our lives as though we're followers of Jesus. Okay. Not being Sunday Christians only. Okay. We must dress right. Now, it came up, so I'm not going to beat you, beat you over the head with it. Okay. I know how dr dress is talked about in Baptist churches. Okay? The Bible is very clear on how we should dress. Modestly. Ladies, the God says you should look like a lady. Men, God says you should look like men. And I'm just going to put it out there. Skinny jeans aren't very manly. Okay? I'm just saying, they're not. It's not modest. Skinny jeans are not modest. Skinny jeans are designed to accentuate certain male anatomy. They're not modest. Man, pastor's picking on the men? Uh-huh, because you ladies always get picked on. And I have daughters and a wife to go home to. That's what God says. God says, ladies, look like ladies. Okay, all you ladies, look at me real quick. All of you look at me real quick. Look like ladies. And you'll never hear me say a word. Okay, men, you can go back to whatever you're doing. Men, look at me. Look at me. Look like men. That's what God says. Now, did I say anything about certain articles of clothing other than skinny jeans? I did skinny jeans because that never gets addressed, and I believe it should be addressed. I do. Okay, I do. It is not modest if we wear anything, man or woman, young or old, it is not modest if we wear anything that accentuates certain anatomy, gender revealing anatomy. Do I need to put it any other way? It is not modest. That also includes what God says, but ladies, that means you don't dress like a dude. Don't. You don't. Guys, don't dress like your wives, your girlfriends, your daughters. Okay? And you're good. Dress like a man. What would people think if I was up here in a skirt? Miss Leah is appalled right now. <laughs> she said, oh. <laughs> yeah. It's, you can't, right? You can't. People, people are not going to want what I got. Because I don't even know what I got. <laughs> Look, I'm not picking on gender. What God, but what we have to live right, we have to talk right, we have to act right. Our, our lives, need, lives need to reflect Christ. And, and if our lives reflect Christ as the salt of the earth, people are going to want what we've got. That includes how we dress. Look, I shouldn't run into any of you in town with a Def Leppard t-shirt on. shouldn't I have met Christians who people who say they were Christians and maybe they were and they had Slayer t-shirts on 
For those of you too young to know Slayer, don't worry about it. Ask your grandparents. <laughs> okay, your parents. Anybody my age or older, right? But look, there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. There's a whole lot of problems with that. I'm not even going to begin to speculate. My point is simply this. It includes dressing right. It includes taking a stand. I know of Christians that won't eat at certain restaurants if they have a bar in them. That means none of your mainstream restaurants. I know Christians who will not eat at a restaurant if it has a bar section in it. I know Christians who, who I know Christians right now today who are not afraid for a moment to go to a bar because they love their food. What do you think the world says when you come traipsing out of the bar with a big old bag? You think the first thought they're going to think is, man, I bet that guy was in there getting hot wings. What do you think? You think that's what the world's going to think? I use this example, and I know it's silly. I love beer bread. It's a bread where you use a can of beer as the yeast. Okay, so it will rise. I love it. Alcohol burns out. It bakes out. I love, that's why I don't mind, like, Italian food. I don't mind that, like, there's a difference between drinking wine and cooking wine. I get it. I didn't understand until I moved to New York. So praise the Lord for bringing me to New York just so I could eat real food. <laughs> I didn't realize. Like I found out a couple weeks ago, I love chicken marsala. I didn't realize that marsala was a wine. It's a cooking wine. I didn't realize that. I'm not talking about that. Okay? Because that cooking wine doesn't have alcohol in it. It doesn't have an alcohol content. What I'm talking about is I love beer bread. I love it. It's the greatest thing. I love it. It's a, if you like a, a, a homemade drop biscuit type bread, you know what a drop biscuit is? You know, all Yankees, so maybe not, but okay. So I love drop biscuits. Love them, okay? Beer bread is like a loaf of drop biscuit, okay? It's just, it's, it's, it might be manna. It might be what we eat in heaven, Okay? That might be what's hiding in the Ark of the Covenant right now. Drop biscuits, okay? They're amazing, and that's what beer bread is, okay? It's, it's like a drop biscuit. I just It's an amazing bread, but I can't have it. I can't. I can't have beer bread. Because there's all sorts of problems with me, not as a pastor, as a Christian. There's all sorts of problems with me walking into Stewart's, grabbing a can of beer, and walking out. It has Look, if one of you saw me that's here, a member of the church who spent some time with me. Who's our newest member in here, Miss Lisa? You've been, you've been around for a year now, online and in person. Man, you've been a year? Good <laughs> grief. You're stuck with us now. But even Miss Lisa, being the newest in here, you guys probably wouldn't think anything of it. You, oh, Pastor's going to make some of that beer bread. Let's be honest. And I could give you proof, right? Because I talk about it enough, I probably show up with it Wednesday being like, you got to try this, right? But the world's not going to think that. Every decision is, that we make must be a decision that we think would a follower of Jesus do this? Is my life demonstrating to the world something that they want? Because the problem is this. If what you're doing in your life, if how you're living your life as a Christian does not reflect a change and a transformation that only Jesus Christ can make, why in the world would the world want that? Because they've already got what you've got on the outside. If they see the outside, and it doesn't look different than their outside, there's nothing for them to want and thirst after. Now, with that being said, let me just for, for consistency's sake, make sure we cover all the bases. That doesn't mean I expect you to live weird. Some Christians go to the far right extreme, but we don't need to be far left either. We need to be on the right side, the correct side. 
conservative. We need to think about what we're doing. We don't need to be loose cannons over here just willy-nilly like, God will give me grace. God will forgive me. We, we can't live that way. We've got to take a stand. We've got to separate ourselves, right? We're separated. That's part of the Baptist distinctives. It's part of what we see in Scripture. We're to live separated lives. We're to be in the world but not of the world. If you look like the world, you're wrong. That's what God says. But I do want to make sure to be clear that we don't want to be the far end of the right either where you draw unwanted and unnecessary attention to yourself. Because people don't want that neither. If you look like you're Amish, people aren't going to want that. Now, I'm not picking on the Amish. I think Amish people are great. Okay, I'm not picking on them, but I'm referring like how they dress. Now, that's their own religious convictions. But we have, but, but we have Christians out there, that's, they go to those extremes, right? Where the ladies, like, their clothes go all the way to the, they cover their ankles. Their dresses cover their ankles. Their shirts come down to their elbows. Their necks are like turtlenecks. Look, I, that can, can, hear me out, in case somebody's watching this later, that can be counterproductive. It can. Because that's a pretty drastic step to the, in the eye of an unbeliever. We all have unsaved friends and family. I'll pick on Miss Lisa because it's her turn. If you dressed in, in long dresses covered your ankle, I don't, but hear me out, hear me out. I know that's why I'm picking on you because she did. Okay, that's why I'm picking on her. Down to your ankles, sleeves all the way down, nothing wrong with it. Next, plenty high, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. Here's what I want, here's what I want, want you to notice. Was it hard, like, was it, what was it like trying to talk to people when they saw that difference? Because we have to acknowledge people see the outside first. Did it make it harder for you? You see what she said? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. If that's what God lays on your heart, you better dress that way. Okay, so if you ladies come in Wednesday dressed that way, that's the Holy Spirit, not pastor, okay? I won't say a word about it. I'm going to look at you like, what in the world are you misunderstood, right? Look, that's not what I'm getting at. And, and you're like, pastor, you're really camping out here. Yeah, because we got to get this part. we got to get this. We don't want to go to that extreme either because it can be hard. Look, you be you. Work out your own salvation. Let, talk to the Lord about it. Say, okay, Lord, how's my dress? How am I dressed? Am I dressing modest? I struggled for a long time with wearing shorts, men wearing shorts. I don't believe there's anything unbiblical biblical about it, depending on the shorts. The problem is, is most of the time, shorts start out like knee length and over the years and you get complacent just like anything in our Christian lives we get complacent and they start riding up riding up riding up and the next thing you know it looks like 1982 track shorts I have underwear that are longer than that <laughs> look so I understand my point is simply this and we got to get this I'm not when I'm talking about dress and and what people uh, it's we need to acknowledge what people see look you shouldn't do anything to draw unnecessary negative attention to our Savior. We're going to draw attention to him if we're living our lives the way that he wants us to live our lives. We're going to draw attention to Jesus because we're the salt. And the salt causes thirst. So we're going to draw attention to ourselves because we have Jesus. There's something different about us. If we're living our lives the way that would bring him honor and glory. But we can also get in the way. And we can also live our lives in such a way that we bring negative attention to Christ. Because we have to remember what it's like to be an unsaved person looking at a saved person. They should be able to look at our lives and want what we've got. Not because we're weird in their eyes. They don't want to be us if we're weird. The greatest 
opportunity we have, the greatest compliment an unsaved person can give you is you're normal. What'd you expect? Look, the only difference between me and you, friend, is Jesus. Sure, there's some things that I don't agree with in your life. There's some things that, but I don't agree with them because I'm better than you. I don't agree with them because God doesn't agree with them. But I'm not better than you. The only difference between me and you is Jesus. That's it. The only reason you're having a breakdown, emotional breakdown, is you don't have anybody to put that burden, give that burden to. I do. It's not that I'm tougher than you. It's not that I'm better than you. I just have somebody to lay my burdens feet, lay my bur- I have somebody's feet to lay my burdens at. That's it. We got to stop being arrogant. As Christians, come on, we got to stop being arrogant. But we do need to live separated lives, okay? So don't misunderstand. I know we spent a lot of time on that, but I had to make sure we covered it. We, yes, heritage, church, as your pastor, yes, we need to live right. We need to think. We need to talk. We need to act. We need to dress. All of those things that becometh Christ. We need to be examples of Christ in all we do. Word, deed, dress, everything. Look, if you're not fixing your hair, God is a God of order. And if you go outside without combing your hair, you're not honoring God. I'm just saying. That could be sufficient for some. Okay? Like, I, I did it earlier. Okay? But look, it's not all messed up. How about you take care of yourself? Look, there's Christians out there that don't bathe. That doesn't honor the Lord, and people aren't going to want what you got. Look, I'm trying to cover everything. Is everybody Okay. Everybody okay? If the church is okay, then I don't care what people watching online think. If the church is okay, right? Are you with it with me? We need to think of all aspects of our life because our lives as disciples, as the salt of the earth, what Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. What he declared, you are, you're there. Whatever, however you feel about it is irrelevant. You are the salt of the earth. I've already placed you there as my disciples. You have the ability to create and promote thirst. If we are living our lives in a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus Christ, people will want what we've got. We don't want to be extreme on either end. Everybody okay with that? Everybody made it? We made it through. Salt also purifies. Oh, we already did that one. Salt produces change. It has the ability to change things. We already kind of talked about this, right? We already talked about it penetrating. But let's talk about it changing things, right? Does it change your food? Yeah. Yes, it goes from sustenance to a meal, right? It goes from, it's pretty good to, it goes from, it's that salt takes Burger King fries and turns them into McDonald's fries. Right? Are you with me? I know that's silly, but are you with me? It changes things. It makes food so much better. How many of you are on a no salt or low salt diet? Anybody? I know we got to have some. How many should be? <laughs> have you tried it? Have you tried to cut salt? It's food just, Brother Eric's shaking his head. It's nasty. Yeah, you're like, what am I eating? This is gross. You want to know how good salt is on food? They make salted Caramel desserts. It's not like caramel's not good enough by itself, but you throw a little bit of salt on there, perfection. Right? It's better. It makes food better. It changes it. It it produces a change. It does something to food to make it better. Have you ever had a a steak with no salt, no seasoning at all, just the meat? I, I actually like it. Because there's a little bit of salt in the preservative used to get it, give it some shelf life. But like fresh butchered steak is to die for. It is amazing. Why is it amazing? Because of the fat. What do you think's in the fat? Salt. Do you know how I know? Because they don't put salt in the hay when they feed cows. But they do put these things out in the field. 
called salt licks. When I was taking care of the ranch, I had to make sure that the horses and the cattle had salt licks. Why? So they would drink enough water. And it produced a change within their body. They were hydrated in the summer. They didn't dehydrate. When you took that big old cow to butcher, you get the salt. But if you've taken that same steak and thrown a little bit of extra salt on it, woo, it just sends it over the edge. Are you following me? Like it changes food. Food is completely different with salt. It changes ice. It changes it. It doesn't just penetrate through the ice, does it, leave a bunch of holes everywhere. No, 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 no. It changes the consistency, turns it into water. You go from to water. It changes stuff. What about, think about this. What does salt, we know this in the north, what does salt do to metal? It eats it. What, what is it doing when it eats it? It's penetrating it. It is changing it. It is changing everything it comes into contact with. Remember what I said earlier. Salt affects change in other elements. Other elements do not change salt. What is Jesus saying? You're the salt of the earth. Be in the world, but not of it. You affect change. You don't let the world change you. That's what Jesus said. As my disciples, you affect change. You don't succumb to change. You take a stand. And you stay faithful. Salt produces change. What's that mean? We can make a difference. We can make a difference. We can make a difference because we're the salt. We are the very thing that Cohoes and Latham and Waterford and Watervalid and wherever you live, we are the very thing they need. Not, be, not because of us, but because of what has done, happened within us. We can affect change. We can make a difference in one life. If we all brought one person to church with us tonight, do you realize there would be twice as many people in here? Crazy, right? You know, if we could get every member here at one time, this place would be full. We've got some folks within our own family that have forgotten that they're salt. They're letting other elements change them. But we're salt. We're not supposed to change. We change all the other elements. Again, not, I'm not trying to boost your ego, okay? Let's not get carried away. i got to wrap up here tonight. I went way long. Let's not get, let our egos get in the way, Okay? It's not that Paul makes change. It's about me living my life in a way that honors my Savior so that the transformational work that he's done within comes out and begins to affect those around me. Does that sum it up? Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Salt provides flavor. We've already talked about flavor. But I do want to look at one aspect, verse 13, the last part. But if the salt has, ha, ha, if the, but if the salt have lost its favor, ha, have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Salt is very beneficial. And it is a prized commodity. Let's be honest. It was then, and I would even say it is today. Our world would not be the world we know without salt. But we need to realize that unsavory salt, salt that has lost its flavor, its savor, what makes it special, what makes it valuable, When it loses that, it's good for nothing. 
Do we want salt that won't melt ice? Do we want salt that when we put it on our baked potato, we don't taste it? You ever have butter that's unsalted? No good. It's not. What's the point? You don't want it. Because salt is necessary for survival in a spiritual sense. Sense. We need those, we need salty Christians who are willing to make a difference for Jesus. We need salty Christians who are willing to, to step up and take a stand and make a difference for Jesus in the lives of others. others. Faithful Christians are of great value because they're the salt. A saltless Christian is good for nothing. Jesus said it. It is thenceforth good for nothing. Not if the salt have lost its savor, but his savor. You, Brother Mike, if you have lost your joy, if you have lost your commitment to Christ, if you have become focused on Michael instead of Jesus, you are good for nothing, Jesus says. That's what Jesus said. You're good for nothing because you have a purpose. You have a specific task at hand. You have a specific role in, the, in reaching people for the kingdom of God. When we become exposed to the world, we begin to get dirty with sin. We lose our savor. What is Jesus saying? I think we could summarize it this way. And we have, and I will close this way. What Jesus is saying to his disciples, you're the thing that the world needs. So go out. Be in the world. But don't be of it. Because the world needs you. This life, look, it's not yours anymore. You gave it to me. When you place your faith in Christ, he became your Lord. He has lordship in your life. That means rulership. It's about doing what he wants. It's about doing things for him. It's about reaching people for him. Not that we're doing anything. Again, it, this, it's an outpouring of what Christ has done within us. This is us being the salt is an outpouring of the transformation that Christ has done within. And we have a responsibility as, as Christians and disciples to be in the world, but not of the world. Let's all stand together, and uh, we'll close in a word of prayer. Thank you for your patience. I got so excited. We're, we're going to have to do something about this time. It really does bother me. Um, if it doesn't bother you, though, then I won't let it bother me. But um, it is something that I, I do. I just get, I get so excited, and, and we get so plugged in. Um, we get growing together and learning together, and it's just exciting. So, uh, but thank you, and, and for your patience and your attentiveness. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Eric, if you would please, sir, close us in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed this evening.